Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Great to see so many people here. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to kick the proceedings off this evening and to introduce the other speakers uh, in a minute. Um, but before I do that, a few words of introduction. Uh, I'm Ian Randall. I'm the past, past president of the Chartered Institute, and I was the sponsor on CIHF Council for this white paper uh, a couple of years ago. So it's, it's great to see it now come to fruition. When I started in my role as president, I chose healthcare as one of the areas to focus on because it was very clear that it was one of the sectors that would ben had stood to benefit considerably from the application of human factors and, and ergonomic science. You know, we, we probably all know about data from 2000 or so which showed that uh, probably up to one in ten of us could come to some harm from our interaction with health and social care. And uh, regrettably, 18 years later, things aren't terribly much better. I've been working in the high hazard industries for well over 20 years and when I started looking into healthcare, one of the things that struck me was actually how much healthcare had to gain from learning from other sectors. Some of the things that have become well embedded uh, in other high hazard sectors in terms of human factors, science and good practice wasn't happening so much in, in healthcare. And I think that's, it, it, there are opportunities for, for, for learning and for, for great improvements. And, and by that, I don't just mean looking for improvements in human performance. I mean looking at the wider system and, uh, in which people work and what improvements can be made in that wider system. So to the white paper itself, uh, this project kicked off in May 2017 with a workshop at the annual conference of the Chartered Institute very lively, well-attended conference in which we thrashed out some of the, uh, the objectives and scope for the white paper. And from then, it's been very courageously and ably led by Sue Hignett and Alex Lang. So great uh, vote of thanks and gratitude to, to you for getting us to where we are today. Um, during the process of its development, it, there's been very good engagement uh, from the healthcare wider community. Um, there were I think uh, more than 100 helpful comments on the, the draft of the paper. I don't know how many unhelpful comments there were. But I think we're very pleased today in, in fairly short order to, to be at a place where we can actually launch our white paper and hope to see the, the benefits that come from that and the, the greater awareness and uh, uh, in involvement in, in human factors and ergonomic science in, in our daily healthcare activities. So over to Sue, Brian, Alex and Paul for the rest of the, the evening. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Ian. It's, uh, it's a challenge to take on the project and I'm just delighted that we've... Uh, been able to, to get this far. So the fundamental question about the white paper is how could and how should human factors ergonomics be implemented in health and social care? And I've got an interest in this from two reasons. One, because I'm a co-chair of the Professional Affairs Board at the Charters Institute, but also because for the last 35, I don't know, 40 years, uh, almost 40 years, I've been a clinician, I've been a patient, I've been an ergonomist, professional ergonomist in the healthcare system, and I've been an academic researcher. So lots of different reasons for why I would feel very strongly about why we need a white paper to act as the authoritative guide to understanding how human factors could and should be used. We see this as setting a bit of a line in sand. This is about setting what should be happening and then let's move forward. And in doing that, 
the white paper seeks to clarify competence and experience. So if you are seeking to get human factors engagement, involvement, purchase in anything, work with someone to talk about human factors, what's the level of competence, what's the level of experience you should be looking for? And that's exactly the same as you would be doing if you're employing any other professional group. If you're getting someone in to do IT work, if you're getting someone in to uh, work as an electrician in your own house, you need to know that what you're getting in, what you're getting engaged with, is the real deal. And that's what this white paper is really all about. So our vision, as part of this uh, white paper, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's build on all the previous good work, and there is a lot of that. But we need to broaden the scope, make sure that people understand what human factors really is, what the profession, what the discipline, what the science is. And I know some of my colleagues are going to touch on that again. The fundamental principle is this promotion of integration of human factors to optimise human, and that's all the humans in the system, patients, families, staff, cleaning staff, um, cl clinical staff, maintenance staff, visitors, um, all the people down the supply chain, optimise human well-being and overall system performance. You need both to be able to say you're doing human factors. We want to raise the awareness of the discipline, and that's what this white paper is really all about. And by championing this accessible, user-focused approach, we need to contribute to develop and embed sustainable system-led improvements. Sustainable is really, really important. If you have improvements which are embedded in humans, the humans change their job, and that expertise, that knowledge, that improvement goes with them. If you embed your change, your improvement, your solution in the system, there is much, much greater chance that it will sustain. So what is human factors? A lot of you in the room know. It's a multidisciplinary science. It draws on the best from many other sciences, from design, from engineering, from organisational management, from human sciences, anatomy, physiology, biomechanics, psychology, social sciences. We are a bridging discipline. We pull together and we look at human interactions between humans and things, between humans and humans, between humans and buildings, between humans and systems. So that is what we do. So our systems, to, uh, to the two fundamental words I often give to my students, systems and design. Understanding how people, technologies, products, physical spaces interact on a very small system, on a very large system and how you can change those systems through design. Within the white paper, we set out three specific areas. The first is to investigate incidents, and those of you who were here at the workshops this afternoon have hopefully had a little bit of a taster about that. It's all about unpacking and understanding, not rushing to a solution, but really looking at the issue, the problem, the incident from many different directions. To do that, you need to think about systems. You need to get these clear mappings, relationships. And I think there is a, there's probably 30 or 40 years of work to do. We are so far behind in this sector compared to other system sectors where human factors embedded, whether it's rail, defence, oil and gas, nuclear, aviation. We are 30 to 40 years behind in health and social care. So we have a huge amount to do in terms of mapping the systems. And then thinking about design. Human factors is relevant to all stages of the life cycle. If you get it in there early, there is a better chance that you won't need to do a retrofit. So I'm going to talk through very quickly an example. And the reason I'm talking about component size mismatch in hip replacement is because there's been a recent HSIB support on this. And one of the investigations, you probably can't read that, but let me tell you, human factors which may... The investigation identified human factors which may hinder... I can't read it either. The identification and verification of the correct prosthesis. So I had a student who looked at this in 2015, and I learned a lot about hip replacement. I didn't realise that there were four component parts to a hip replacement. And that, excuse me, it is a never event, which means it should just never happen. Sadly, it's costing the NHS money. And the reason it's costing the NHS money is because we get these mismatches. The head's too large or too small, the modular junction too large or too small. And you can see the trays of components that are available within the operating theatre to select from. This is taken from the HSIB report. 
and is used as an example for where something went wrong. Yuan, 68-year-old uh, man who underwent a total hip replacement. It was a very good surgical team. Unusually, they work together regularly and are strong supporters of five steps to surgery. They're very safety conscious. However, a latent error is built into the system because the head of the socket has two measurements. It has a diameter and it has a length. And they have to select from the components storage. The surgeon had specified one of the dimensions. So when she asked for the particular dimension, plus five, the circulating practitioner gave it to the scrub practitioner who confirmed, plus five, handed it to the surgeon. The surgeon assumed they were getting. However, the socket and the head were different diameters. And this came to light a year later when the patient was reviewed and he had some discomfort, some looseness in the joint. The surgeon checked the operating notes and found that the diameters of the socket and head weren't compatible. Now, the reason I've highlighted the bit at the bottom is that this is not just a tragedy for the patient. It's a tragedy for all the people involved in the system. You know, I was a clinician. You do not want, you don't go into that job to do things wrong. And we all know this. So, you know, the team is going to be devastated that their error had caused harm to a person. In the recommendations, safety observations, HCIB number one recommendation, the National Serious Incident Reporting System does not require inclusion of data regarding human factors such as environmental conditions. What does that mean? What do we mean by human factors? So I'm going to just share with you a little bit of my student's project to what that means. So we have to understand the system. How do we do that? Well, the particular tool, and I think this is a tool that could have really wide application across all of health and social care, is one called hierarchical task analysis. And what you do there is you set out, you describe the activities of a specified task. So for this case, we're talking about component selection and implantation. Ordering the implant, preparing in the OR, uh, activities happening within the operation, and then after the operation. And I'm just going to unpack a little bit about the implant selection. We can get hugely detailed in these. This is where we turn into nerdy engineering types and, and we go into the depths. But actually, that's what's happened in every other industrial sector. And I think that's what needs to happen in health. And oh, let's look at who the players are in this. We've got a surgeon, we've got an ODP or a rep. We've got verbal communication happening and we've got a scrub passing to a surgeon. There are a lot of people involved in this system who all may have slightly different mental models of what's going on or may work differently in different teams. And we need to understand. We don't just need to go in and say, do this differently. We need to unpack it and we need to understand it and what's going on. One of the HCIB uh, findings there, which we were already aware of, was that the packaging is not standardised. So packaging that you get from different manufacturers has the size of the implant located in different places on the packaging and uh, with different sizes of text and different fonts. And they're trying to read it in this environment. So let's be realistic about what we as human beings can do, what our eyesight's like, what sort of lighting we need, how we communicate, how we record information, how we look for things. I don't know how many of you have driven cars where you have the indicators on one side and the windscreen wipers on the other side and you've managed to get it wrong. I have. You know, we're human, we make errors. And if you give us opportunities to make errors in the supply chain, well, somebody will. And then we get the wrong information being sent down the chain and we get the mismatch happening. So one of the recommendations um, is that the verification process needs to be standardized. And another recommendation through the BSI Standards Institute is that labeling on packaging needs to be standardized. But actually, as purchasers, as the people with the money, we can influence this as well. It doesn't just have to come from top down change of standard, it can also come from bottom up. I'm not buying that unless the labeling's right. So it's the power of the purchaser as well. So we're looking within this white paper to increase human factors competence and capacity. And I've highlighted in red what my challenge is to you. And I usually get a little bit of, really? You think every health and social care organisation should have an identified HF advisor? Now, by identified, I mean qualified. I mean qualified to a minimum level of a postgraduate certificate in human factors from an accredited 
course by the professional body, which is the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors, who is also the regulator for human factors in the UK. This would be the same as is required in the defence industry to be a technical member of the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors. If it's good enough for defence, it's good enough for healthcare. That is my challenge to all of you. We know that human factors can have more impact when you have the expertise embedded within the organisation. And let's build on the expertise in safety and in quality improvement that is already there and build these multidisciplinary teams to take this forward. We've got some excellent precedents for why we should do this. WHO Resolution 2002, we need to strengthen science-based systems. NQB Concordat, importance of human factors in improving the quality, um, safety and quality within healthcare. And in 2016, Health Education England identified that human factors approaches should underpin patient safety and quality improvement science to get this integrated, evidenced and coherent approach. And most recently, this was when Jeremy Hunt was still minister back in April, signed the Tokyo Declaration, yay, pledged to support and enable implementation of changes in systems and practices to support improve patient safety. And here on, after next year, 17th of September, we will have a World Patient Safety Day. Let's hope we can really show how the white paper has been taken on board, embedded, and is influencing at the next World Patient Safety Day. Thank you. I'd like to hand over to Brian.